Good day to you people of the internet. So as I'm sure you've heard by now, the Radeon 7 has recently released, which makes it a fantastic time to get a good deal on a Vega 56 and a Vega 64. So I fortunately got really lucky on an eBay deal about a week before the Radeon 7 was released. I was able to get this MSI factory refurbished 8 gigabyte Vega 64. This is the Airboost edition. Um, in addition to an EK full cover water block. So I didn't want to switch over to the water block immediately. I wanted to test this card out, make sure, put it through its paces, uh, get my baseline benchmarking in, and make sure that it itself could handle uh, the overclocking that I was throwing at it on air, so I know I can push a little farther on water. But it's been about two months now, and the card's been running rock solid. So I went out and I bought a full cover backplate from EK, because of course I want it to look pretty nice in the build. And I'm hoping you guys are interested in coming along for the journey of putting the block on. So let's move over to the workbench and get started. On the bench, we have the MSI Vega 64. This is the Air Boost Edition, so it's got a little overclock to it. We've also got an EK full PCB cover water block here. Um, this block looks brand new. It's still got the plastic covering the case badges. Um, it does have some used uh, thermal transfer pads, which we're going to replace, but it's almost flawless. It's going to look really nice in the build. I'm super excited about it. So let's start tearing the Vega apart. Let's start by removing the 10 screws on the back of the card. They're just going to be a standard Phillips. So it's six in the back plate and four on the GPU plate. Now some things to take note of is we have a switch right here on the back of the card. That switch handles the GPU TAC lighting. Let's see if we can get it in focus there. So you can either turn the lighting on and off or set the colors from red to blue. So decide what you want your lighting to look like for your case and make those settings before you put any new back plates on because it will cover that switch. We've got 10 more Phillips screws to remove from the back of the board. Next, we'll flip it over to the PCI bracket and remove the six screws there. With all those screws removed, we should now be able to separate the PCB from the stock cooler. Now there is some lighting in here, so let's not forget to unplug that. Looks like we've got one more cable down here in the corner. And there we have it. We've successfully been able to separate the two pieces. Next step, of course, is going to be cleaning off all of this old heat sink paste. That thermal paste that was on there sure is sloppy looking. With that thermal grease out of the way, we can focus on removing the remainder of the thermal transfer pads. We should be able to remove the two Phillips screws that are the last bit holding on this PCI front bracket. All right, and let's give it one final cleaning. Now that we've got the pads removed and we've got the grease removed, I'm going to use a little isopropyl alcohol just to go over the FETs and the chokes and make sure that everything is really clean. Now 
Now I do use a blue a lint-free shop cloth for this kind of work, but it's still a good idea to go over it with some compressed air when you're done. All right, so we've got that cleaned up pretty good. That die sure looks nice. And install the new PCI plate which is gonna be a single unit plate. Instead of the dual PCI plate that comes originally, gonna give it just a nicer finished look. All right, we've still got the four screws on the front to put back in. Now that we've got the card prepped and ready, let's clean up the water block. We'll clean it down with some isopropyl. All right, we can set this aside again. Now let's look at thermal transfer pads. So the Vega uses two different thicknesses of thermal transfer pads. On the MOSFET, it uses 0.5 millimeter, and on the inductors, it uses one millimeter. So again, the water block that I got was used, and even though that these thermal pads don't look horrible, they kind of feel like craft singles, which is disgusting, but even though they don't feel horrible, I'd still prefer to use something fresh. So I've got some Arctic branded thermal pads that I'll cut up for this, 0.5 millimeter and one millimeter. Uh, these have got great reviews on Amazon. They were fairly cheap, I don't know, maybe about 15 bucks a sheet. Uh, so I'm gonna get these cut up and ready for the card. With your thermal transfer pads cut, you can go ahead and start laying them out on the board. Now I've got them prepped into two separate piles here. I've got my one millimeter thick thermal transfer pads for my MOSFETs and my half a millimeter thick transfer pads for my inductors. Let's get them laid out. I went ahead and left one side of the protective layer on the thermal transfer pad still there so I don't get any dirt or stuff stuck in it while I'm applying the grease and uh, getting ready to set the block top on. <clears throat> so let's go ahead, I'm gonna use um, some Arctic Silver 5. Now there's a lot of theories out there for grease applications. Some people put an X, some people put a dot. I like to spread it. I like to make sure it gets good coverage and that my layers aren't too thick. Now you want to make sure that you get some good thermal grease in between all the dyes. Now you can see copper color coming through here and you can't through these. So this is where I still need to get some paste applied. The next steps are going to be remove this last piece of protective layer and get the water block on top. We're almost ready to put the block on. Everything looks good. Everything is covered. The dyes have excellent coverage. All the MOSFETs and inductors are covered. Definitely not missing anything on the instructions. Water block looks clean. 
Let's get the two pieces put together. Well, that looks pretty successful. So we've got to make sure to read the literature carefully because we're just not installing the standard back plate. We're going to be using the EK plate. So it looks like we're going to use 10 screws to anchor the card to the water block and then another six screws to anchor the back plate to the card. So let's start off with the water block. Now we've got these tiny screws with plastic washers. Make sure to use these washers. We don't want to short anything. And we'll use our back plate as a guide to make sure that we are not putting screws where we're not supposed to. Now I'm just putting one here in the corner to help keep it steady so it doesn't slide. But the first part that we're going to focus on truly is the CPU or the GPU. We want to make sure that there's equal pressure on uh, the GPU above all else. So we'll do a, a typical star pattern uh, as if we were putting a heatsink block on a normal CPU. Okay, that came together really well. This is going to be a very attractive addition to the build. Looks very utilitarian. I can't wait to get the back plate on. So there are some thermal transfer pads we need to apply to the back as well. Looks like we're going to put 1.5 millimeter transfer pads above the diodes and then 2 millimeter on the back of the GPU. Now I did buy this back plate new, so it did come with some stock pads and I'll get those cut to size here in just a moment. Really got to remember to turn my mic back on. Well, with these pieces cut, let's go ahead and lay them out on the diodes and back of the GPU. We're going to test fit the back plate just to make sure that everything is level. Peel those pesky backings off. Reseat the back plate. and install the six backplate screws. And there you have it folks. What a sight to behold. It really is an attractive card. Okay, I'm pretty happy with the way this turned out. I was even able to reuse some of the hard tubing that I originally bent for the Fury X. I had to trim a little off the front and a little off the base coming out of the reservoir, but all in all, it was an ideal fit. So you could probably see, I still have some more hard tubing I gotta do. That's because I'm getting ready to install the monoblock that I purchased to replace the Wraith cooler that came with this CPU. Taking a look at benchmarks, the first graph you see here is my 3D Mark Fire Strike score. Now to get a baseline number here, I ran my Vega 64 at stock on air cool uh, I got 17,117 points. Now, before we look at the rest of the graph, it's good to know that a modern GPU will tune and adjust itself very similar to a modern CPU, meaning that if there's available thermal headroom and available voltage, um, the clocks can do their thing and, and adjust themselves higher. So just on a pure voltage standpoint, we went ahead and uh, increased our power limit slider to plus 50%. And just by doing that alone, we were able to net a 4.78% increase in performance above our base Fire Strike score. Now looking at this from a thermals point of view, leaving everything at stock except just having a water block, we were able to get 5.25% increase in performance above our stock score. Now you combine all that uh, in addition to a 50 megahertz memory increase and, and a 2% overclock on the GPU, and we're getting 12.71% in 
giving me my highest fire strike score at the time of filming of 19,294 points. Moving over to Time Spy, our baseline score is 7,368. Now we're going to repeat a lot of the same tests here. We're going to move the power limit to plus 50% power, and that gave us a performance increase of 3.84%. Now when we swapped out the air cooler for the water cooler, the stack performance didn't go up so much. We just got a 0.74% increase of performance, and that number is so small it could even be due to testing error. However, when we combine the increased 50% power limit, 50 MHz of the memory, and 3% overclock on the GPU, we're getting 9.66% extra performance above the stack number and that gave me my highest time spy result to date of 8,080 points. Watching that loop start up looks pretty cool, doesn't it? Well, thanks for joining me for another adventure of installing a water block on a graphics card. As you can see, there's definitely some clear benefits to adding a water block to your card. It's going to run quiet, it's going to run cool, uh, and your overclocks, you can run them stable um, at a nice quiet level. If I were to run the overclocks I was using to get these numbers on uh, air cooler, it'd make the system pretty loud, and you'd probably only run that hard for benchmarks. But with the water block on here, I can just keep those pegged as a normal setting. Um, anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Maybe you learned something. If you did, hit that like button, possibly subscribe, and we'll see you on the next video.